call to worship this morning is from Psalm 107. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this. Those He redeemed from the hand of the foe. Those He gathered from the lands from east and west, from north and south. Mr. Joseph Wagner will introduce our opening hymn for today. Our first hymn this morning, number 147, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, number 147, and we'll stay and sing.
we thank you for Jesus who has come to us, Emmanuel, God with us. We do pray this morning that you would be with us by your Spirit. We pray that you would draw near to us, and that we, uh, moved by your Spirit, would draw near to you in worship, praise, and adoration. We thank you, O oh God, for your many blessings. We thank you that you are good to us. We pray for your blessing on us as we gather for worship, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's remain standing and we will confess our faith in the words of believe, the Apostles' Creed. It should be there. I mistake. Yeah, I forgot. Let's see how well we know. <laughs> I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the conscious fire, was crucified, died, and was buried, and descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Jesus had instructed them. 
They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called the house of prayer, which you are making it a den of robbers. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Number 247, Come, O Come, Thou Quickening Spirit. Number 247, and we'll stand According to his glorious might, 
so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving thanks, excuse me, giving joyful thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word this morning, we pray that your spirit would shed light on that which you've given to us. We pray that you would illumine our hearts and minds, that we would see Jesus in his glory and be uh, conformed to his image. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would deepen our love and our knowledge of you in your ways. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time of year, we receive many requests for help, either in the mail or television or in person. I recently had an individual contact me and ask me personally for financial help for an orphanage overseas, and I didn't know enough about it to uh, respond uh, in that way. I mentioned to him that I would pray for him, and somehow that seems to be somewhat inadequate, doesn't it? We wish that you had the resources to be able to contribute to this need and many other needs. There are so many needs, not only out in the world around us, but also our families, our loved ones, uh, church connections. There are many uh, needs that are apparent at this time of year, and many voices cry out for help. And sometimes it can be quite overwhelming to look at all of this and to consider what would God have me do it's at times like this that uh, we should perhaps pay some attention to what Paul does here, who himself, I think, would sympathize with our circumstances. He was in a situation where the needs were greater than what he could uh, uh, handle. Personally, he was sitting in a cell in Rome, and so his freedom was limited by uh, his incarceration. He received reports of churches uh, in Asia Minor where he had recently served and he was concerned about some of the things that he had heard. There, were, there was much to give thanks for. He rejoiced in the evidence of God's spirit at work in their lives. We saw that last week with regard to Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. He rejoiced in the evidence of the grace of God at work in their lives for the faith in Jesus Christ, the love that they had for the saints for the hope that was secured for them in heaven. These things were evident in the life of this congregation, and that gave him cause to give thanks to God who produced these things in their lives. And so Paul had much to be thankful for in that regard, but he also had words uh, of concern for this congregation because they were situated in a rather hostile environment, hostile in many respects. Uh, first of all, there was certainly the temptation to go back to their old paganism. In Colossae, the congregation there was largely a Gentile congregation, almost entirely Gentile. And they were brought up and raised in the pagan environment with all the many false gods, the, the Greek gods that were there at the time. And uh, there was always the temptation to go back to that worship, that pagan worship. And no doubt it would have been... Uh, a help to them because if they go back then they have all the old associations, old friendships, connections, business connections all rooted in the worship of that day. And so by setting themselves apart from that and following Jesus Christ, that made their lives quite difficult. Financially, economically, socially, it demanded sacrifice. And so there was always the powerful temptation to go back into their old paganism. Some would sense that that was not the right path and to struggle against the influences of paganism, not only in its false worship, but in its immoral lifestyle, there is the, the, the additional pressure of those who come into the community from outside who profess to be uh, teachers of the ways of God, indeed uh, those who honored Moses and his law, and they would say that you need to do something more. If you're going to fight off the temptations of the world and the flesh that are before you, yes, you need faith in Christ, but you need something more. You need uh, various uh, 
forms of asceticism or uh, severe treatment of the flesh and the body to pursue more intellectual, ascetic, spiritual things. And so there were various temptations to go off into it, the wrong direction, uh, countering the uh, temptations of the world and the flesh with a kind of hostile treatment of the body and an emphasis on spiritual powers and, and illuminations, secret rites and rituals that would help them through this life. Paul seeks to address the congregation that is facing these different pressures on them. And in uh, doing so, he recognizes that he himself cannot be there with them every day, instructing them and counseling them in the way that God would have them to go. They needed to grow for themselves. They had to wrestle with these things and uh, understand the Lord's will for themselves. And so Paul is moved to pray for these people. Pray that God would be at work in their midst, strengthening them to have the wisdom to discern God's will in a wicked world. And so what we have here in Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11 in particular, is Paul's prayer request for these Colossian Christians. Prayer drives us to our knees. Prayer drives us to the point where we recognize that we don't have the resources in ourselves to satisfy the great needs that are around us. We need help. We need God's help. God needs to be at work in this particular congregation in Colossae, and He needs to be at work in our congregation here in Percasy, other congregations around the world, within our families. We need God's help. And the more we see the struggles that we face day after day, the more conscious we should be that these struggles, these challenges are above us. We need God's help. And so we should pray for one another. The early Christian church placed a great emphasis on prayer. In fact, the ministry was largely devoted to prayer and the ministry of the Word. You recall in, in the book of Acts when a variety of social needs arose within the life of the congregation. The elderly, and the, the widows, the orphans were not being fed or were be, being overlooked. Uh, there were men who were set apart to address those uh, very real, tangible needs. But the apostles themselves were relieved from those responsibilities and duties so that they could give themselves over to prayer and the ministry of the word. The importance of prayer transcended the apostles' efforts in regard to ministering to the widows and the orphans and the needy. That might seem rather harsh. You're going to pray about it? Oh, thank you. <laughs> but the early church understood that this is the way in which God works in the life of His people. And we need God's help, ultimately, to address all of these needs. Not only these earthly temporal needs, but the more deeply personal and spiritual needs that the congregation has. And so prayer played an important role in the life of the early church, particularly in those committed to the ministry. Paul gives us a window into his prayer life here in these opening verses. Uh, the, this letter to the church at Colossae is a part of his prison epistles, Ephesians and Philippians also being among them. And here in these letters you see more and more of Paul's prayer life opened up for you. Some of the other letters we don't see quite so much of Paul's prayer. In fact, in Galatians, <laughs> there's virtually nothing in there about Paul praying for the churches of, Col of Galatia. Uh, he, he was very upset with them and the way that they were uh, retreating from their hope in the gospel. But here with the churches of Ephesus, Philippians, Philippi, and Colossae, uh, there are more peaceful times, and Paul opens up his heart and reveals his prayer life for these people. And his prayer life here addresses some of the most fundamental needs of the Christian churches. Needs uh, that we are not often very uh, concerned about or interested in, but are needs which demand Paul's special prayers, prayers of 
those who are in pastoral leadership, uh, those who are elders within the church, and then we too can learn from them and make them a priority for our own prayer life. Certainly there's a need to pray for healing and for help and for relief and, and, and blessing in, in the lives of God's people, God's uh, work in our country as well, in our churches. But Paul emphasizes some other aspects of prayer, or really of our great need before the Lord. And the first thing that he, he addresses in his prayers is our need for spiritual wisdom, an understanding of God and His ways. This was uppermost in Paul's mind with regard to the church at Colossae, that they would rightly understand God and His will for their lives. And so he, he, he prayed for them, that they would grow in their knowledge of God's will, that they, they would understand that in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, these uh, words of uh, information and knowledge, if you will, uh, are uh, gathered together to focus on the many different aspects of this knowledge of God that must embrace our lives. One of the things you notice here is Paul's emphasis on all or uh, everything. Uh, he wants them to have a fullness of knowledge in, in terms of the will of God and allow that will of God to suffuse all of life. It reminds me of a, a poem that I came across in college by Gerald Manley Hopkins, a British uh, Jesuit uh, writer uh, who, whose poetry was not published until after his death because he was afraid that his poetry would upset some of the church officials. One of his poems is a beautiful poem called God's Grandeur. And the opening line of that poem is much like the rest of his poetry, kind of uh, a very uh, electric use of language. It's filled with uh, energy and, and vitality. And so he says something to this effect, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. And he goes on to compare this grandeur of God that fills and suffuses the entire world as like uh, the light that reflects off of uh, shook foil, this is language. You know, if you have golden foil, or, or we have aluminum foil today, but you have that foil and, and you know you shake it up a little bit and it develops little lines and crinkles and, and then you bring it under the light and all of these many uh, wrinkles in the, in the light flash and show a certain brilliance to them. And for Gerald Manley Hopkins, as he looks at the world around him, he sees the world uh, radiating in the glory of God, this grandeur of God being revealed in all of life. And he wonders at how uh, people in his day could miss the grandeur of God. Instead, the poem goes on to talk about how men have trampled with their uh, shoes on their feet on the world that God has made, and the world is filled with the smell of men. He almost senses distaste and corruption for it as he probably walked through the uh, business district of London and smelled all the smells of the city and so forth and felt the trampling of boots on the ground and so forth. Oh, the wonder of the glory of God and yet how it's trampled by men. And we so often fail to see that which is so evident to him. The grandeur of God charging every aspect of life. Paul's prayer is something like that, that this knowledge of God and His glory, who He is and what His will is for our, our lives, should so uh, charge our hearts and minds that all of our thoughts are of the glory of God. They are suffused through and through such that we have a full and complete understanding of God's will in every circumstance of life. Life presents us with many different challenges. There are so many different ways in which we must think about how God wants us to live in this circumstance and that. What is God's will? How are we to understand Him and His ways? I think of the, the uh, long-running television show Jeopardy! with Alex Trebek, in which recently they had a, a special broadcast with the uh, IBM Watson computer competing against uh, Ken Jennings and... Rudder was the other guy's name, I forget his first name. 
But they had this competition, and they, they had to beat the, the IBM computer at answering all the questions, or the, presenting actually questions to the answers that Trebek gave. And of course, the computer beat these great champions. It was much faster, and it came up with the information through and through. Sometimes I think, I wish I had an IBM computer brain like that, that could take all the many aspects of the Word of God and know exactly how to apply them to every moment in life. Well, we have far more than that if we grow in the knowledge of God, the Creator of all, and allow the knowledge of Him to fill our minds and hearts and illumine us so that we can have a perception as to what God wants us to do in all of life. Knowledge is the accumulation of information, and that much is important for us. We must know the facts about God's will and His ways, know the facts about redemption, what God has accomplished for us. I should note that even theology is ethically uh, characterized. Um, your understanding of the nature of God, the way of salvation, uh, the, the nature of justification and sanctification is ethically charged. There's a right way to understand God's will and His ways and a wrong way. Uh, we've, in our uh, midweek meetings, been discussing God's work of predestination. Well, uh, you have a, an ethical component to that. Is it right and just to understand that God has ordained all that takes place? Is it right and just to say that God has chosen some and passed by others? There's an ethical component to all of our thinking about God and His ways. And so when Paul prays that we would know God's will, it's that will that embraces all of life, what we know and what we are to do. All of it is to come under this knowledge of God. And Paul prays that we would have this information at our hand. But then he prays for spiritual wisdom, wisdom that comes from the Spirit. That ability to take that information and properly apply it to the daily moments of life. That's where I wish sometimes I had that computer mindset. But here we have the Spirit to give us this wisdom, that practical knowledge that works its way out in the various moments of life. Uh, inevitably, wisdom is found in the paths of obedience to God's will and God's law. And we show foolishness when we depart from God's will and go in our own ways. So the wise path is always the obedient path. And certainly that's what we would learn from Proverbs. Wisdom and understanding. Understanding is that deep perception into the connections, the relationships between things. How does uh, theology relate to ethics? How does one ethical act affect another ethical act? Understanding sees the whole of these things and puts it all together. Sees the grand unity of God in His ways. Do you have this in your life? Do you have knowledge, wisdom, and understanding? All rooted in the will of God. Certainly we face many challenges today as the early church did. To know God, to know His will. The early church faced a Gnosticism of its own day, a pursuit of information. We face that today in the modern church, in the mainline churches, an understanding of knowledge and wisdom, a knowledge of the ways of the world, a scientific understanding of the world. But it's a way that forsakes God's revealed will, His written, inspired, inerrant word. And so it seeks a wisdom apart from Scripture. We need to have the wisdom that's rooted in God's revelation of Himself. And when we depart from that, we get into lots of trouble. The mainline churches in many ways develop a Christian faith which has the words and languages of Christianity. But it all covers a religious naturalism. An explanation that does away with all the supernatural aspects of our faith and explains everything in natural terms. The creation or the development of the world is understood naturalistically. The unfolding of evolutionary forces. The miracles of Jesus are understood naturally as uh, like we saw in the feeding of the 5,000. Everybody giving a little bit extra. 
naturalistic understanding. The resurrection of Christ, the death of Christ was a death of a religious teacher. Sacrifices of himself in love for his disciples. But not an atoning sacrifice for sin. Paying for our justification by his sacrifice of himself. A naturalistic understanding. His resurrection becomes naturalized. It wasn't a, not a supernatural raising of his earthly body that was crucified on the third day, such that he appeared before his disciples in that real body, still having holes in it from this, the, the nail wounds. No, it, Jesus rose in the memories of his people, and he lives in our hearts today. That's how mainline churches understand the resurrection. All naturalism. It has the words and language of Christian faith, but at heart, it's naturalism. It is the voice of the dragon. It is the voice of apostasy. It's an evil, destructive voice. And many attend these churches today thinking that they're in a Christian church because they have the Bible in front of them. They're talking about Jesus. They're talking about a good life and a life of love. What could you ask for more than that. But it's all demonic at heart. It's hostile to the gospel of Christ. It's foolishness departing from the ways of God's word. And so we need wisdom to be able to address these things. We need an understanding of the truths of God so that we might be kept from these things. Do you know God's will? Paul does not simply want you to have a, all kinds of ideas in your head, but he wants you to work that out in practice. He wants you to walk in ways that are worthy of the Lord. And so this information is not designed just to sit there, but it's to work its way out into your life. That is always the way of it. Your life reveals what you think. And what you think works itself out in your life. There's no disconnect there. And so if you fill your mind with the Word of God and have that Word dominating your perspective on life, that will have an inevitable impact on the way you live your life. You will live your life in the fear of the Lord. But if you rarely give any thought to God and His ways, that will make itself evident in the way that you live. And so pray, Paul prays that they would have an understanding of God and His ways so that they might walk or live a life that is worthy of the Lord. That is worthy of His great work of grace. That's not to say that their life earns salvation for themselves, but it reflects faithfully on that which God has done for them in Christ. And so they are to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Who can do that? Uh, that's hard to do. But Paul breaks it down into four ways, and let me briefly consider each of them. First, he talks about bearing fruit in every good work. You'll note that there are four participles. And that's why I read from the New International Version here. If you have the English Standard Version, it breaks it up in a couple of ways that make it hard to see the order that Paul has here. There are four participles, bearing fruit, uh, growing, um, increasing in strength, and giving thanks. Uh, these are different ways of explaining how we live in a way that is worthy of the Lord. So bearing fruit in every good work. God wants us to live fruitful lives. There are many who are engaged in good works. You will see them today. You will see them in the news. We had a wonderful example, and I, can't, I don't wish to judge the particular individual in this situation, but we had an interesting video of a police officer this week in New York City coming to a homeless man who had no shoes or socks on his feet. And he went into a store and bought socks and shoes and gave them to this homeless man so that he could be kept warm. And he didn't do that to have anybody take his picture or anything. He just did it because the man was in need. And that's a wonderful thing. Now, I don't know what motivated the officer. I don't wish to judge him. It may have been godly motives. But it could have been simply human compassion, outward concern, and that sort of thing. And it's wonderful in and of itself. But good works, truly good works, are done for the glory of God in the name of Jesus Christ. And we miss the fruit of those good works if we do them on a humanistic level, just because it's a good thing to do. We bear fruit 
in good works when we do them to the glory of God by the power of His Spirit in accord with His will and His Word. And so Paul wants the church to bear fruit in their good works and live a life that pleases the Lord in this way. Growing in their, uh, in their understanding, they need to make progress in their Christian faith. And then being strengthened with all power according to God's glorious might. Paul, again, begins to pile up these, word, these descriptive words, uh, talking about our need for power and strength for our uh, Christian life. Certainly we understand that. We understand that sometimes I know the right thing that I should be doing, but I don't have the strength to do it. I just don't get it done. All kinds of things interrupt. Paul prays that we would have all strength and all power to do that which we need to do. Not that we become all powerful like God, but that we have the power that we need for each day to do each good work. Do you have that great power at work in you? You know, there are folks today talk about the power of God and what the power of God in their lives. And they, thought, they think in very extraordinary terms of performing miracles and doing great works, building great things and big churches and all these kinds of things. We wish that we could have many of those things. But look at what Paul says. He wants these people to have power so that they can endure. So that they might have patience. Sometimes... It's all that we can do just to endure, just to get by. We're overwhelmed with the weaknesses of our bodies, with the, the problems with aging. We're overwhelmed with disease and cares and all these kinds of things. And sometimes it's all that we can do just to get to the next day. Paul understands that. And Paul understands too that we live in a wicked world that is hostile to, to the Christian faith and oppresses us day after day. And sometimes all that we can do is endure. We need the power of God even for that. To endure, to be patient in the various circumstances of life. So pray for God's power to be at work in you. And finally, Paul talks of giving thanks for God's great uh, work on their behalf. They have a wonderful inheritance laid up in heaven for them. They will be Members of God's great kingdom of light. They even take part in that even today. Paul prayed for his churches in his day in ways that instruct us in how we should pray. We should be a praying people. We should be praying not only for ourselves but for each other. And we should be praying in these terms. That God would give us an understanding of His will and His ways, so that we might walk before Him in a manner that is worthy. Pray that for me. Pray that for each other. And you will see God granting us grace to walk in ways that are pleasing to Him. And I give glory to Christ our Savior. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this privilege we have of drawing near to you in prayer and bringing our requests to you. And so often we do occupy our prayer life with the many needs that we have and you invite us and call us to let our requests be known to you because you care for us. But we pray too that you would help us to see that there are spiritual needs that we have. Needs for understanding, wisdom, and knowledge. Needs for strength, power, and might. And we pray, O oh God, that you're Spirit would bestow these on us today and each day, that we would grow in Christ and be a glory to your name. We ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond to the goodness of the Lord by bringing before him our morning tithes and offerings.
Let's stand and praise the Lord for all these many blessings in our life. Let's stand and sing this praise.
comfort it is that God's word is never broken. It is sure and reliable. We can rest on what God has said. Depend on it for our lives, for our future, for our destiny. God has provided us in his word a salvation which is complete in Jesus Christ. His death on the cross fully, fully atoned for all of our sins. And his righteousness is complete and perfect. It shines with the glory of God. And that righteousness is that which covers us through faith. And so we receive that righteousness and rest in that righteousness alone. That is the good work that we rest on, not our own. We come to this table, which is God's fatherly provision for us. It is a meal for us in our spiritual journey. As we travel to that heavenly city, renewed by God's grace, we have the blessing of the Word of God to speak to us. We have the blessing of the Spirit of God to strengthen us and to guide us. We have the blessing of this meal to give us grace, strength for the journey. Like Elijah on his long journey, God provides us with spiritual food, feeding us on Christ and His works, so that we might safely enter into that great and heavenly city. This meal is but a foretaste of that which is yet to come, the wedding feast of the Lamb gathered in that heavenly city. And as we take part in this little meal, we anticipate that glorious meal that is laid up for the people of God, and we will receive all the benefits of our redemption Jesus Christ. And so Christ invites us to come, to come and eat, eat his flesh and drink his blood, eat of the benefits of his redemption, his death for us, and receive nourishment and grace in him. We should come to this table repenting of sin and resting in him and him alone, and by the help of the Spirit take part in a worthy manner. Embracing these elements in faith, recognizing that as the earthly elements strengthen our bodies, even more so do they strengthen us spiritually as they point us to Christ and His work. We've confessed our sins before the Lord, we've repented of them, we come before Him now and seek His blessing on this meal. Let's join to pray for the Lord's blessing on this meal. Father, we thank you for your mercies to us in Jesus. We thank you that in him we have all that we need. We pray that you would forgive us for our many sins, sins against you and against one another. We pray that you would grant us grace that we might more faithfully and fully walk before you. We thank you for this meal that strengthens us, strengthens us for the journey. So we pray that your spirit would bless the bread and cup. Bless them to us that we might feed on Christ and all his benefits. We pray that Christ be glorified among us as our living Lord, our resurrected and ascended King. We pray for your blessing on us in his name. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples. As I am ministering in his name, give this bread to you.
said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is for you. This do in remembrance of me. Savior also took the cup, and having given thanks, as has been done in his name, he gave it to his disciples, as I, ministering in his name, give this cup to you. Father, we thank you for this communion meal whereby we can draw near to Christ our Lord. We thank you for all the benefits that we have in Christ. And we pray that your Spirit would communicate them to each of us today. That we would grow in wisdom and understanding and knowledge. That we would have strength and power to walk in your ways. That we would grow in our faith and be pleasing to you in all things. We ask for your blessing in this meal in Jesus' name. This time, as is our custom, we would like to take up an offering on behalf of the needs of those who are around us. It need not be a, a big check or a big offering, just a little something to give to those who are in need. Would be on them. We pray for um, 
those who have difficulty with hearing, we pray for your hand of blessing. Father, we thank you for your mercies on us as a church. We pray for your blessing on our country and on the work of missions abroad. We ask it in Jesus' name. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Number 149, we'll stand.